And while we're still standing, we would love to hear the Christmas story. So Lily is going to read to us now from Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor over Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds, keeping watch in their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Come on. Yes. That was awesome. Lily, will you pray for us? Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we get to be here. Lord, I pray that you would help us behold that there is a Savior who is born this yes. day, and he is still living, and he is Christ the Lord. Yes. Help us adore you, and let us come and worship you, and help us know that the greatest Christmas present is to hear your voice. Yes, we God. get to hear our dad's voice and he's the king of kings and we're princes and princesses and lord we thank you for that amazing privilege that you sent your son as a baby to die so we could become royalty in jesus name i pray amen amen you may be seated amen lily i feel like we might just need to let you keep going up here girl oh, oh i need to uh wipe my tears from that. The Lord is good. Merry Christmas. Um, I just love what these next few days hold. And I love all the kind of hype and hoopla and nostalgia and food and everything. But, but more than anything, um, I'm just praying tonight that, that we would not just be here and do a little religious church service or check a box. Um, my great heart and hope is kind of like like Ian just shared, that God would move, okay? That you, that you would experience the presence of the Lord wherever you are in your story, okay? Uh, you are loved here, you're welcome here, and we just, we're praying a pretty bold prayer that you would see and experience like the living God of the universe and the meaning of Christmas. So, so uh, every year I, I give the honor of sharing the Christmas story, of doing a little teaching in Christmas. And I always do it just a little bit different. God kind of highlights something to me um, in a new way. And this year I have just been really captivated by a word, okay? There's been this word that I've been thinking about and processing and it's been popping up in all these Christmas songs that I've been singing and we sang it tonight, a whole bunch, okay? It's the word adore. Okay, I've been thinking about that word adore. And if you uh, Google the word adore, what you'll find is it means something like um, to love deeply and intensely. Okay, it's like a love with, that has depth to it, that has intensity to it, which makes sense to me because it seems like it's just more than saying, I appreciate you or I like you or I even, you know, I love you, man. To say, I adore you seems to carry some weight and some, some power to it. Okay, my son uh, Bennett, he was saying, Dad, when I hear that, um, a Bible story kind of pops in my mind. If you're not that familiar with the Bible, there's this woman, her name was Mary of Bethany. 
okay? And she was a follower of Jesus, and her brother, Lazarus, was raised from the grave. And after this happened, Mary kind of walked into this dinner party, saw her brother, saw Jesus. She just kind of like broke forth, and she took this alabaster, alabaster sorry, jar filled with this very expensive fragrance, and she broke it, and she poured it out over Jesus as if to say, you can have my all. Like, I'm devoted to you. I'm committed to you. I, I adore you, Jesus. And I'm all in to follow you. And so um, when I hear a story like that, and when I think of a word like adore, or when I think of the lyric that we sang 15 times, oh, come let us adore him, I do a little bit of like self-reflection and actually ask myself, do I really adore God? Like, do I adore Jesus with this depth, with this intensity? Or has it just kind of become a routine in my life? Do I adore him? Let me just, let me just acknowledge this. For some of you, um, you love Jesus. You love God. This week is like, if there's a fire of adoration in you, it is like hot and strong, okay? It is burning, all right, because you adore Jesus. But let me acknowledge something else. For some of you, like, let's just keep it real. For some of you, maybe believe in God, but when we talk about actually adoring God, adoring Jesus, that, that's like an emotion that's kind of off, of off of your radar. And if that's you, I respect you that you're here. Um, I'm going to try to push the needle in your heart a little bit. And for some of you, and um, to be very vulnerable, to be very real, I would often put myself in this category. There have been times in my life where I love and adore Jesus with this heart of flame. And then there's times, and I've even been in seasons of it recently, where I'm saying, God, like, I want to adore you. Like, I want to love you. Like, I want this to be the burning passion of my life. I'm like pastor person. I'm supposed to do that, right? God, would you build that in me? Would you fuel that in me? Because I want to be able to sing, not just like a, you know, karaoke song. I want to sing from the depth of my heart. I want to adore you, Jesus. Okay, and if that's you, if that's anywhere close to you, um, I want to tell you that there's something in the Christmas story that I think will speak to you. It's been speaking to me. Okay? I have been studying for probably the hundredth time in my life the Christmas story, and God has been showing me something in there that has actually been fueling my adoration and making me fall in love with Jesus even more. Okay? And it is in the response of the shepherds. All right? So we're going to go to the shepherds. We're going to go Luke chapter 2, and once again, I am going to be talking about the shepherds. Okay? And so let me kind of set up to go where we're going and tell you, you know, if you've been familiar with church world, if you've been to Christmas Eve services before, you probably know that the shepherds were kind of an unexpected crowd to get this message, okay? In the ancient world, the shepherds were kind of considered the outcasts and the outlaws and the kind of people that you didn't necessarily want around. Um, they were living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Um, by the way, they were, they were young and old, men and, and women, even young kids, I mean, it wasn't all like, you know, 60-year-old, long-bearded men, okay? Like, like, there were all kinds of people, but if you studied the shepherds, which, which I did a little bit more this week, this week I kept coming across these words that all had the prefix un in front of it, okay? They were considered unimpressive, uneducated, unsophisticated, unclean. And let me pause on that one for a second. Um, when you say the shepherds were living out in the fields, it literally means like they were living, camping out with their sheep in the fields. These were not like the shower often, floss your teeth, wear deodorant, you know, use a loofah ball kind of guys. Like these were, these were like, they were very literally unclean, okay? And um, I don't know if any of you... Um, I don't know if any of you have had a baby in the last two or three years or have gone through hospital birthing room protocols in the last two or three years. But there is like a passion for cleanliness and who gets to go in the birthing room, 
Okay, you are hand sanitizered up. It's probably only husband, nobody else. Like, we need to keep it clean in the birthing room. I don't think the shepherds would have, like, been welcome in a single hospital birthing room. And yet, here they are in the birthing room story. Like, it's, it's, it's wild and crazy because they would have been considered the outcasts unclean. And let me say one more thing. This one actually hurts my heart, okay? And hurts my heart if some of you feel like this. They were considered unclean physically and unclean morally, spiritually. And one of the applications of that was they were not allowed in the temple of God. They were considered unclean. And so if you would have been a shepherd, you would have been like, okay, then I feel unworthy. Like, like if God is real, obviously my life is too messed up, too broken, too dirty. Like I am not, I am not good enough to be in the presence of God. All right. Your lie, if, that, if that's something you've believed for a lifetime, I just love this point. I make it almost every year. Praise the Lord that God intentionally said, I have good news of great joy for all people. And let me just put a divine punctuation mark on that and to say, I'm going to show up first to a crew that nobody think would have been worthy to hear this message. I'm coming first to the shepherds. And that's a message to anybody in this room to say this. I just say this from the depth of my heart, okay? I wish I had the right words to say this. I'm just going to, you are not too far from God. You are not too, too messed up and broken. God doesn't look at you and say, if you just clean your life up, then welcome to my presence. That's not the way it works. All right, I'm going to talk about this a lot later, but he loves you with a fierce forever coming after you love, wanting to be in a relationship with you. He's not asking for you to clean up your life and be a good Christian and then welcome to my presence. He's saying, I actually have a radically different plan. And it starts with me not saying clean up your mess, but me saying I'm entering the mess. And let me kind of illustrate it by saying, let me be born in the middle of nowhere in a stable cave laid in a manger, surrounded by sheep and goats and sheep dung in Bethlehem, Middle East, nowhere to say, I love you and I'm entering your mess. But he appeared first to the shepherds, okay? And if you would have put a lot of unwords in front of the shepherds, there's one word that you cannot put in front of them, and that's this, unresponsive, okay? Because the shepherds heard a message, and I want to show you their response. Because there's something in their response that I think caused these, you know, guys that didn't believe in God, didn't know Jesus, to leave the story with this bright fire of adoration, okay? That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. So I want to show you their response. Verse 15. Let's go to it. Let me just show you up on the screen. Verse 15, watch this. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, here's the first thing, first response, ready? The shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. And let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. First thing they said was, let's go. Okay. Now, I think that's profound because here are these shepherds, middle of the night, all of a sudden, angel explodes the light into the sky, sheep scatter, glory of the Lord shines around them. Then all of a sudden, the angels go back. The sky is black. And there is a moment that they went through. And there's a moment that you can go through. Okay? So I want you to picture this moment. They've heard the truth, the mystery, the magic, the beauty of Christmas. They heard the truth. They looked to one another. And they could have said, let's go back to the status quo. Like back to sleep and back to sheep right? Let me say that one more time. Like, like flash in the sky, amazing news. Everything's changed. All right, well, back to our normal life. Or they could say, this truth will jolt our story. And we're leaving our status quo. And we're going to pursue this truth that's been presented to us. Okay, so can I, I just look in your eyes and tell you one of the great dangers of Christmas, okay? 
Most of the world goes through this. I'm praying we don't, okay? For the next 48 hours, there will be this nostalgic, beautiful, magical, mysterious, like memories, food, gifts. And then about 36, 48 hours from now, it'll be like, all right, there's more trash in the trash can, more leftovers in the fridge, and a decision. And here's your decision. Do you Monday morning go back to the status quo of whatever the modern equivalent is of back to sleep, back to sheep? Or do you let this truth jolt your story? Do you let the truth that the Savior has been born and he wants you to grow in your adoration of him? And there's something to discover. Is this the year that you might be willing to say, whatever it is that's become status quo and normal in my life, I'm willing to go after you, God, and to change the story. Are you willing to say, let's go? Because he can work with a heart that, that like that, okay? Not only did he say, let's go, but watch this next thing. Let's go to Bethlehem. I love the next sentence. And let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. This word see is a very, very important word, okay? If I were to kind of go into the etymological Greek roots of, of this word uh, see biblically, okay? There's a difference between the word look and the word see. Look means just to, you know, observe, casually to watch. To see, I want to read you the definition. To see, here's what to see means. To see is to perceive and to know by experience. Let me say that again. To see is to perceive and to know by experiencing something. So, for example, um, if you're in the, I don't know, if you're in the dating phase of life and you say, I'm seeing somebody, it means, yeah, I'm actually making this commitment, this devoted, like, through experiences, we're getting to know each other. I'm going to see and learn by experience, okay? And I want to I wanna share with you something that um, I've been praying about, and I feel like the Lord is placing on my heart to share with this crowd in this moment. Um, I really feel like for some of you in this room, I love you, I'm going to say this kind of boldly, for some of you in this room, it is time that you stop observing Christianity and observing Christians and that you see Jesus. It's time that you stop looking in on Christianity because when you just look in on Christianity and Christians, you will see a lot of hypocrisy and you will see a lot of maybe political agendas and you'll see a lot of, hey, they're saying this, but their life doesn't match this because they're doing this. And you'll see a lot of maybe 48 other things. And can I tell you something honestly? I probably agree with you on all of them. And maybe I'm even guilty of many of them. But I can also tell you a truth that the weight of eternity in God's word stands on, and that is this. When you see Jesus, when you experience Jesus, when you follow Jesus and grow in your love with Jesus, he changes you, and something happens in your heart. Stop looking at Christianity and holding followers of Jesus to this level that makes you turn away from the whole thing. It's time you encounter Christ. I promise you the greatest thing in this world is Christ. I promise you. And these shepherds, when they not only said, like, we're coming, when they knelt by the side of a manger in the birthing room of Christ and looked at him, they saw him, and they fell in love, and that little fire just sparked into flame. Another danger, and this is more of a danger for a religious crowd, to be honest. Maybe some of us fall more in line with this. And here's the danger, okay? Jesus called out some religious people in his day and age because they knew a lot about the Bible. They knew a lot about God. They taught and even judged others about God, but they were far from God in their heart. And Jesus called them out. And he said, literally, this is what he said. He said, you know the scriptures, but you're not seeing me. All right? And for some of you, and sometimes I fall into this camp, my heart gets a little dry because I fill my brain with so much Bible data and growth and learning and learning and learning. And God's like, hey, I want you to see me. I adore my wife who I've been married to for 25 years. And 
I'm learning more and more about her. Sometimes I'm like, what? I didn't even know that about you. I thought I knew all your responses. Um, but I adore her when I'm with her and when my heart is stirred up with her, not just knowing more about her. And for some of you, my prayer for you is that this would be the year that you'd say, okay, I'm ready to leave the status quo, jolt the story, follow Jesus, and Jesus, I want to see you. I want to grow in my relationship with you. I want to learn. Okay? Third response. Let's go. Let's see. I love this one too. Next thing. Verse 17. Watch this. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. As soon as the shepherds saw, you, you couldn't shut the shepherds up. All right? They're like, we've seen something and we want to tell. Let's tell. Okay, so um, my wife makes fun of me on this. Um, but often when I like have an amazing meal, or when I see an awesome movie, or when I like read this great book, like, like I'll eat this meal and then I tell everybody I care about that they need to eat this meal. Like I tell everybody to go to this restaurant. So my, uh, my son Caleb and I, we have this thing where, where we love eating street tacos at different places. And whenever we eat street tacos, we like take a picture and send it to each other. And we try to like tell each other, like describe how amazing the tacos were. And can I tell you something? I think that as I do that, I actually grow in my love slash adoration of those tacos. <laughs> like, like there's something about that that stirs my heart up. And when you tell about what the Lord has done, when you tell about him, when you tell the story, God uses it to stir you up, to, to build your adoration, okay? And what were they telling? It says they went and they told what the angels had said. And what did the angel say? Please don't miss this, okay? It's probably the most important thing, so don't, don't miss this. The angel said, I have good news of great joy for all people. Now watch this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The angel didn't say, hey, uh, uh, an awesome teacher is born, as if the fundamental need of the human heart was to be taught. He didn't say, a great moral example has been born, as if your fundamental need and my fundamental need was somebody that could model, that we could follow. He didn't say, a great leader has been born, as if our fundamental need was to be led and guided. He said, a savior has been born, meaning the profound need of your heart and my heart is not so much to be taught, guided, and led, though all of those are true and he will do all of them. The most profound need of the human heart is to be saved, all right? He wants to rescue you. He wants to transform you. He wants to save you. He don't want you to clean up your life and then woohoo, you make it to heaven. He's like, you can't do it on your own. I'm coming after you to rescue you and redeem you and transform you. I'm your savior. Look at me. He's the one that you've been waiting for. And you can take that longing and you can put it in all kinds of other ways and fill that gap with all kinds of things in this world and you'll only be thirsty because you're thirsting for Jesus. They're telling, the angels are saying he's born and he's the one you've been waiting for. And the shepherds heard that and they told everybody. All right. And then final thing, not only let's go, let's see, let's tell. But then I was blown away by this. Um, again, I feel like I've, uh, I, I don't know, my identity is changing. I used to always feel like I'm the young, cool pastor, but now I've been a pastor for 23 years. So I'm not young anymore. I'm still cool, by the way. I'm not young anymore. I've probably preached this text. I, I can't even count how many times, and I've never seen this. Okay? Verse 20, the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. Meaning, they went back to their flocks, to their friends, to their profession, to their family. They, they went back. 
They returned. However, this is what blew me away. They returned, and there was a different description on their lives. At one point, every description on their lives was an unword, unimpressive, uneducated, unsophisticated, unclean. You name it, that was them. Now, they go back, and the very definition of their lives and how they live is adoration. They went back to their flocks glorifying and praising God. I highly believe that for the vast majority of the people in this room, that God is not saying, leave your profession, move away. He's certainly not saying, leave your family. He's not saying, but here's what I think God wants to do. I think he wants the defining mark of your life to be a fire of adoring Jesus because he's worth it. He's just, he's just worth it. And the shepherds, these unimpressive dudes that, that didn't even believe in Jesus, said, all right, we're going to make a decision. Let's go. For some of you, it's the time, it's the year to make a change to go. And then they said, let's see. For some of you, for many of you, it's the time, it's the year to say, I want to grow in experiencing Jesus, not just filling your head with more Bible data and not just like criticizing Christians. Get to know Jesus. For some of you, it's let's tell. If it's the most important thing in your life, like open up your mouth and let it be known. Like, like, let it be known that he's changing your life. That will build your adoration. And for some of you, it's saying, and let my life be defined by this fire of adoration. And I want to close like this. This is like a tender, beautiful, emotional, incredible story that's happening in the Newman family right now. So, so this year, our family is going to radically change, okay? Because in a few months... My second-born son, Bennett, who is, by the way, deeply in love and ready for life to make a profound change. In a few months, by God's grace, he will have a ring, he will have a plan, and he has a girl that he is about to give a forever offer to. And my son, Bennett, is getting down on one knee um, and basically saying, will you marry me? I, I want to give you a forever commitment that I will be an adoration of you, okay? And let me just pause on that for a moment because this level of commitment, this kind of thing, it's not, and I'm going to apply this in a second, it's not, okay? Hey, I believe in you, and uh, I'm going to say a little word, a little prayer, and then we're done, and then I'll see you 20. No, no, a commitment like this is saying, I want to walk with you and be with you in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow. I'm in with a forever yes. By the way, I get a daughter out of this deal, which is awesome, because I've, I've only had four boys, and we're ready for a daughter. And sometime next year, our lives are going to profoundly change. And can I just tell you, can I tell you the greatest truth I know? Look at me, some of you, I, I might not see you for, for a while, and I just want to tell you, the only thing that actually matters and the greatest truth I know, okay? The God of the universe, he loves you. He wants to be in a relationship with you, okay? He wants you to know him, not just one day in heaven. He wants you to know him now. He wants you to experience his adoration. He wants you to adore him. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And I don't even know how to give a greater truth than this. The king of the universe is saying, I'm coming for a bride, and I want you to be my bride. I want to be connected to you, and I have a forever offer for you. And we're not naturally in a relationship like that. We are sinful, broken, far from God. Eden is destroyed. And God is saying, I am going to renew Eden. I'm coming after you and I want to make all things new. And he came to this earth, was born, laid in a manger. He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross. He rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. And look at me. He's coming again for his bride. And he wants it to be you. And he wants it to be me. And, and so I can just sort of slam bad theology, easy beliefism. It's not just, oh, I believe in you, God, and I'll say a little prayer. Now are we good until we go to heaven? What if marriage was like that? 
Ashley and I have been married 25 years. There's ups and downs, sacrifice, joy, sorrows. You give your life to Jesus, and in some ways, your life will not be easier. In fact, I think there'll be things that'll be more difficult, especially in the years to come. All right? And yet, there is no greater joy, no greater eternal joy than a Savior who loves you and will indwell you, and we will blink. And the kingdom of God will be fully here for the king is coming for his bride and he wants it to be you. He wants it to be you. Stop playing this game with God. He wants you to love him and know him with a forever love. All right? And he wants to build adoration in us. And so this is what I'm doing this year, okay? I'm saying, God, I've chosen to follow you and I want you to take the flame inside me and fuel it and build it up in your presence. I want to be alive in adoration. And I'm praying that for you. And we're praying that for this church, that we would be a light that is shining in the darkness with our love for Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm, I'm done. But before I'm done, I, I just want to, I want to pray on behalf of us in the room. And I want to make an offer, okay? For some of you, you are ready to follow Jesus Christ for some of you, I think you're ready to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. You're ready to say, like the shepherds, all right, we're not going back to the status quo. Let's go. All right. And so first, I just want to offer a prayer if you're here in this room and you are saying, I'm in. I want to follow Jesus for the first time. And if that's you in the quietness of your own heart, you can, you can pray with me. And then I'm going to offer a prayer if there's anyone in here that's saying, I confess I've drifted and I'm ready to follow again. So let me, let me pray. If you'd like to give your life to Christ in the quietness of your own heart, just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. And thank you for this beautiful offer that I can be connected to you. I believe and I receive. And I want to follow you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior forever. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And with your eyes just continuing to be closed, if there's any of you that want to just recommit, like, like I want to, I want what I once had. This fire is so low. I want what I once had. Let me just pray on behalf of us. God, I confess that, that my pursuit has sometimes been apathetic. And I want to follow you boldly again. I want to follow you. I want to know your presence. I want you to be my greatest joy, my greatest life. And I confess that I've let other things get in the way. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would renew that first love within me. That you'd burn it bright again. I love you, Jesus. Build my adoration in Jesus' name.